Thank you very much. Quantum is real, and I want all of you to see it just like I see it. Uh, I want every one of you to walk out of here feeling a little bit of the power of quantum and how it can be used to solve today's problems. First, come to a place that's very familiar for me. This is a place I like to do quantum a lot. This is Puerto Rico, where I'm from. This is a nice beach. You see, uh, doing theoretical physics is, um, is very similar to writing, because you sit with a blank sheet of paper and you write stuff. Uh, I think the main difference is that the, the editor is reality itself, and it tends to be a harsh editor, which is why you have to use a lot of math. Now, as a physicist, the first thing I notice in this beautiful beach is that it's protected by these rocks, and there's a little gap in between the rocks. If you walk by the beach and sit on this rock here, you can get a better sense of what's happening. The Atlantic Ocean comes, it's over here, and the waves come through this gap in the rocks, this slit, and then they create a circular pattern as they come out. This circular pattern, it's always going. It's been going for thousands of years, and that's why it's created this perfectly circular beach. This is a place where I like to do uh, quantum physics at. Um, and yeah, I, there's a bottle of rum there. It helps a little bit with the physics. <laughs> um, this wave behavior is an important part of quantum physics. There's another part, which is uh, that things in the universe are particles. And I want you to just take a look at this laser pointer. You can think of it as photons, little particles being shot at, like, like a sniper's rifle. And that's why you have this point here. However, in quantum physics, we say that also everything in the universe is not only particles, but waves at the same time. And a good way for you to see this and understand this will be to use a laser pointer. You can do this at home with a green laser. And a hair. Give me one second. I need a hair. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna glue it here with uh, double-sized sticky tape so I don't lose it. But you don't need to do this at home. Okay, so I glued the hair here. It's vertical here. You cannot see it because you're far, but you can do this at home. And I'm gonna shine the laser pointer through, through the hair. Okay, let's see. There, maybe the people in the front can see that you get like a horizontal line. Remember, the, lace, the hair is vertical. There we go, that helps a lot, yeah. The hair is vertical, and you get this horizontal light with dark and bright spots. This is because each of the photons from this laser go on both sides of my hair at the same time, and then the same photon on the other side interferes with itself as if it was a wave. The dark and bright spots are basically the peaks and the valleys of this interference patterns, kind of like two ways coming to meet each other. This is, the this is known as quantum superposition, and it is the fundamental thing that you need to understand to get a sense of uh, quantum physics. Now, I want you to come now to bring this to a, a somewhat more like real thing, and picture yourself at a bar. Maybe you go to the bathroom, and as you're walking out of the bathroom, you realize you maybe had a few drinks too much. So you're looking for your friend, everybody was watching the game, and you cannot find your friend because everybody's wearing a similar shirt. So you walk a bit, and of course you realize maybe you're stumbling, and you walk towards the first person you see, and you stare at them, you cannot see so well, so you squint a bit, and it's not your friend. So you take a step to the left, stumble, it's not your friend. You take a step to the right and look at the first person again, and so on. Um, until you find your friend, or until they call security on you and a bouncer comes and asks you to please leave, you're bothering everybody at the bar. <laughs> <clears throat> now, if the security, if the bouncer was a physicist, he will think that this random behavior of yours actually can be modeled in simple mathematical ways. One way will be to say that you're acting at random, although you seem very, very uh, doing something complicated. Maybe you're walking as if you were flipping a coin, and the outcome of the coin determines if you go to the left or to the right at each step, and then again and again and again. 
So this will be a way that the bouncer could start tr trying to find some structure of your behavior and determine where they can find you in the next, next time. So maybe one time you do a particular path of random stuff, and the security guy sees you and determines, oh, I found him here. Next time, you do another path, and they find you here. Now, if this happened many, many, many times, the security guy might be able to get some statistics on you. Also, if this happens many, many times, it means you have a drinking problem, so you probably shouldn't do it. <laughs> now, the main thing that you have to know about being drunk is that it follows this distribution, which is, a, it looks like a bell. It's known as the bell curve distribution. And the only thing I want you to remember from this mathematical uh, formula of the probability of finding a drunk is that the important quantity is, this, is how the spread of this bell curve, how, how fat it is, basically, how thick it is. Um, because this determines how farther you have, you, you have straight away from the center. So this will be, for example, um, if, you wait, if you start and you are caught a few steps, you're most likely to be at the center of the bar. Well, if the, the security guy takes longer to find you, you might have wandered off to the side, so it might be a little bit harder to find. So remember, this is the most important thing about being drunk, but I should add that it's the most important thing about being classically drunk, because you can also be quantum drunk, and it is quite different. OK, so remember the superposition that I discussed about the hair? So that the, each photon could go, will go both on the left and the right side of my hair. You can do the same thing with all kinds of quantum phenomena. And you can try to come up with uh, saying that uh, some quantum information could be both in zero at one together in a superposition that is only actualized at some times. So instead of having a bit, you have a quantum bit or a qubit that is also on superpositions. And if you had a drunk that is flipping a qubit instead of a coin, the drunk will also go both on both, both uh, left and the right simultaneously at the same time. And then again, and then again. And it will interfere similarly like the, like the, like the hair and laser situation. So this is how the quantum drunk will look like. It goes to both sides at the same time, at each step. And in fact, at some point, it is in all possibilities simultaneously, in a big superposition. When the security guy comes and looks at him, the position is it's actualized to be just one. So it is never actually seen in all the positions, uh, it, although it was in all the positions. Every time it's seen, it actually becomes just randomly one of these positions. The security guy will then get some statistics on the quantum drunk and learn that the quantum drunk is different than the classical drunk. So here's a way that we can, we can look at it. So if the, if the classical drunk was like a bell curve, the quantum drunk is very jagged. So you have very sharp highs and lows. This is because, this is because as a consequence of the same dark and bright spots that we saw at the beginning with the laser. Um, Another thing is, like, I like to call so if this is the bell curve, I like to call it this like the fangs or like a vampire teeth curve, because you see like, it looks like big teeth. And finally, the la important la last thing I want you to remember is that this one actually, the drunk, tends to be more on the sides, never at the center. It's more spread out. And this is the single most fundamental thing that you have to understand to feel the power of quantum and how this can be used. It's the fact that quantum effects can be more spread out in this way. So now, let's put the drums to do something useful, a useful task, just so you understand how we can use quantum to do better stuff. So we put them in the labyrinth, we put them by the entrance, and see how long they take to find the exit. So first we send the classical drunk. It gets a little lost in the middle, and finally finds an exit. All right, pretty good. Now we send the quantum drunk. Remember, it, goes, it flips the qubit and goes into superpositions of all the possibilities, and it also finds the exit. Now, if we did this with more drunks, we will start noticing that with time, actually, the classical drunks tend to get like a little stuck at the beginning, at the middle, tend to like take a little bit longer. In fact, this means that the quantum drunk in this kind of labyrinth is exponentially better than a classical drunk at finding the exit. <laughs> and this is known as quantum advantage. This is the power of quantum computing. <laughs> So why is this power of quantum computer useful or meaningful for anything in real life? 
This is, the, this is what we have right now as is, uh, the status quo in, quantum, in, in computing nowadays. A lot of different kinds of supercomputers. We call them classical computers because they use bits instead of qubits. The ones that use qubits we call quantum computers. Um, with, nowadays we're getting more and more data this, the, every day. And these computers cannot get fast, fast enough to keep up with them. So this is the challenge for computing nowadays. We just have, the problems are getting bigger, more complex, and too much data. They just cannot get fast, fast enough. So because of this, we, we, we can use quantum computers that have some advantages for some problems to address them. However, there's a lot of hype about quantum computing. Um, there's a lot of stuff that's actually not true. And I want to focus on what's real so you get, like, you get a sense of how to, how to separate what's real from what's not. So first, um, a lot of people say that the quantum computer works because it, tries, it does all the paths in parallel, as if it was different parallel worlds. And this is not quite true. The way you program a quantum computer actually is that you program all the paths together and bring them together in such a way that you can increase the probability of finding the exit. So it's not that you try all the paths and then choose the right one. Is that you use them all together to increase the probability of finding an exit. This is not going to replace quantum classical computers. It's going to be an additional service. Classical computers are actually quite good at some tasks. Quantum computers are, well, are, are also very good at solving some very specific uh, problems. Finally, I want, to, I want to highlight that because of this promise and how it can be used for many, many kinds of technology, it's going to change how we do security, internet security, logistics, um, chemistry, pharmaceuticals, new materials for green energy, all this computer power, the main applications are big fields. However, it's going to take a while to get there. Um, so this is why you only see big companies right now working, investing in this, because they're investing in the future. And in terms of the hardware and having real stuff, there's a lot of teams around the world building better and better quantum computers every day. In fact, just two days ago, IBM made a gigantic announcement. I just didn't have time to put it here on the slides. This is, this is cutting edge stuff, const constant barrage of news about who's building the biggest, better quantum computer. I think, personally, that the next, the next choke point for this technology is not going to be the size of computers. I think that's going to get resolved soon. It's gonna, they're going to keep being successful. It is that we do not have the people that can program the computers. So the reason why we don't have people to program these computers is because first, it's limited access. These computers, they are, um, they are expensive and hard to get access to. There's not enough talent. You need people that know quantum physics, engineering, and computer programming. And they have to be very good at all three. And finally, yeah, you need long-term play, which is you have to expect that the, the actual money is, is going to start coming in in some time. This is why we are focusing on trying to make these computers more available, increase the collaboration, and bring a diversity of experts together to be able to work on this stuff. We're doing this using the principles of open science, open source, and open data. And our idea is just give them the tools, use the internet revolution to like drive the quantum revolution. <coughs> So um, I, I've, been, I've been talking about the power for industry and all that, and, and that's not why I'm doing this, actually. The reason, it's very personal for me. Um, just today, September the 20th, um, I was here in Hamburg. I was working in Hamburg at the time. And um, uh, Hurricane Maria, the strongest hurricane on record at the time in the Atlantic, hit Puerto Rico, where I'm from. And um, I was terrified. My family was there. Um, and it was, uh, we didn't hear about them for a long time. My parents are fine. But um, it was a humanitarian crisis in all possible ways. Um, a lot of people left the island. A lot of people died. Um, a lot of people have been fully recovered. And the, the infrastructure is not even close to anything. I, my son was very concerned about his grandparents. And we have been after. We have visited them. They're OK. But I felt really powerless that there's nothing I can do. I do think that quantum computers will be 
one of the factors that's going to help us solve some of the big problems that we will need to prepare for further difficult things and maybe ameliorate their effects. Quantum, it's very personal for me. Um, it's, I've been dedicating my whole career to it. First as a theoretical physicist, writing equations on a piece of paper. Now I've joined a startup just to make this happen, to build tools so other people can use them to make the big changes, solve the big problems in the world. My son, um, he also plays with, the building, uh, with building blocks. They're not qubits, they're Lego for him. He also likes swimming, and these are, these are a picture I took when last time we were at the beach there. And I am concerned that the same problems that we have seen, that's going to get worse. And as a father, like, it's really hard to learn that, that sometimes you cannot fix the world for your son. So um, the reason why I'm doing this is I'm hoping that by me, I can somehow bring all possibilities together to increase the probability of maybe others making a dent in the, the world's problems. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.